Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Mr. Nassim Taleb. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So just to um, uh, start off, we, you know, Nassim, you actually have some prepared remarks. I'd love for you to kick it off, and then we'll continue the conversation. Yes, I mean, it's not that uh, they're not remarks, by the way. <laughs> so hold on, let me, uh, they're, they're much less remarks than pictures I'm going to show. Anyway, so uh, I just wrote a book called Skin in the Game, which is volume five of a collection called Inserto. And uh, it, it takes a while to figure out what you're writing, what your subject is. You know vaguely the details, and then little by little, things start to um, sort of like uh, uh, mix uh, together to provide a, a little more unity. To, to the so it took me a long time. And now I figured out what it was that I was writing about for the past 20 years. See, I started in life as a trader. <laughs> I was a trader. Then I started doing that kind of stuff. See, so I didn't start like by doing theory and going to practice. And I noticed that when you start with practice and then start figuring out the theory, that about 90% of the theories you know are nonsense. And, and then some things are useful, but then that pr process of going from practice to theory is very different from the one that people have, you know, usually. Uh, uh, going from theory, they study and then they apply, and of course they misapply. And then the other, so I became progressively a. Uh, I start retiring into this for also by by doing mathematics of risk mostly, mainly because um, of, of lack of other hobbies. <laughs> uh, to be honest, or incompetence in other hobbies. Like I'm not very competent at tennis. Not competent at chess, I lose concentration, and which annoys the person I'm playing with. So, I'm, I, I, so I have to spend my days doing this. <laughs> so, and, and while doing this, I start discovering some stuff. And the first thing I discovered is that without skin in the game, this is what happens to a profession. Skin in the game is really when you have something at risk in any situation. So you learn, and also it's the filtering. So I'm not going to talk about skin in the game, but one of its consequences. What is it that we don't quite get about probability and stuff like that? So the first thing I'm going to talk about is fat tails. Fat tails was a subject. Uh, fat tails are not tails. You know, fat tails for animals. It's, uh, I'll describe it in a few minutes. What's the difference? It's sort of the subject of the black swan. By saying practically everything you study in statistics at school is useless for the a domain I call extremistan. As a matter of fact, every single intuition you'll build at school will not work. And let's see how. Say I, I take randomly two people, and this is called, it's called the catastrophe principle. I take randomly two people from the population, randomly, and. I measure them, and, and I have a very unlikely sample of a total height of 4.1. What's the most likely combination? 10 centimeters and 4 meters? <laughs> Even in Canada, I don't see. I mean, see worse things in Canada we've heard, but not. OK. Where's it going to be? 150 and uh, 260? No. Two and two, two, two or five, two or five. So, so in that domain called mediocristan, if you have a bad year, it's not going to come from one bad day. It's got to come from two events. As unlikely, uh, it, it's much more likely to have two times three sigma events than one times six sigma, or two times five sigma events than one time ten sigma. And that pretty much, by definition, tells us what a Gaussian is, what that domain is, and uh, that no extreme can really blow you up if you diversify. The portfolio theory is based on that. You're not going to have, if you have a hit, it's not one stock, it's a combination of stocks. If you have one mishap and not one combination of things, which is the Six Sigma idea. All of that fails because I'm going to give you given that we have high net worth individuals. I think by now, 18, uh, 36 million is not high net worth anymore. It's something like <laughs> I mean, with inflation, now we start to get inflation. But it's US, it's real money. 
In U.S.? In U.S. <laughs> okay, so U.S. They make it pound, euros or pound. All right, although, you know, in a few hours a pound will <laughs> So I select, take randomly two people from the population. And I happen to have a very weird sample that has a total wealth of 36 million. That's the most likely combination, 18 and 18. What is it? 35.8, even better. I tell you, if you take the, uh, on a planet, 35.995. One has like $200 right, net worth, and the other has the balance. So it tells us that in domains, like finance, if you're going to have a hit, it's going to come once, not a series of bad events. It's more likely to come. Not 10 sigma in the market is vastly more likely than 2 times 5 sigma. You see, and uh, so the, the fat tails. Now, with this, we understand that the ruin, you have to be a little lot more paranoid. And thinking about it is not think, changing the color of the dress. Not saying, oh, we're going to apply. The, it is uh, fundamentally constructing portfolios differently, doing things differently. And for example, people don't quite get it when they. Ebola is from Extremistan. If I hear. Ebola has killed maybe, at some point someone made a joke that more people transited, more American citizens transited through the bed of Kim Kardashian the year where we had Ebola, then died of Ebola. <laughs> so, so it really it, it didn't kill many people. Do we have, but look, uh, 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 smoking, 450,000, sorry, it's US centric. Uh, alcohol, 86,000 people. We got to worry about these. <coughs> no. Because if you go to Mars, or say the, the, you guys have like places in Canada that are very similar where you can no contact. <laughs> okay, you go spend two years, and on the way out, they tell you, well, the death toll on a planet was about a billion. What is it likely to come from? Smoking or Ebola? Conditional on a tail event. <laughs> Odds are it's going to come from that multiplicated process that can cause these things. That's the fat tail. This is why you have to worry about ruin coming from these things that are very fat tailed. And financial markets are fat tailed. So that's sort of like my, uh, you know, ideas 101. Now let me give you some counterintuitive things here. I have a few counterintuitive points until a few people are getting sleepy, you know, tired of these counterintuitive points. We'll engage in conversation to you know, rewarm it. Go, okay, like that? Okay, yeah, by all means, go ahead. Your risk profile is not an average. The consequence is that, very simply, not one person here, no matter how hard you try, with your own money or your fund's money or your client's money or your grandmother's money, Nobody here will get the returns of the market. Okay, simple. You may get more, may get less, or add less going forward. Let's see how, why. Because, you see, how many Americans walk down the aisle thinking that this is permanent, so permanent status, and, 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 and for them it turns out to not be permanent? Divorce, 50% rate. So, and, and I'm sure they're not like viciously getting married knowing they're going to divorce. Okay? <laughs> so when you engage in a portfolio, you may want to get out. You may change your allocation. Something may happen. You may be forced to reduce your risk. Forced. Odds are you will be forced to reduce your risk. What happened then? Decouple from the market. Which is why you can't get the market. But there's something even more vicious that we're going to talk about here, called pest dependence. <laughs> I don't know, the experiment has never been tried in Canada as a formal scientific experiment, rigorously, but has been tried in other places. And let me report. If you wash your clothes first and iron them later, second, you get a different result than if you iron your clothes first and then wash them later. Do you agree with me that the sequence matters? So taking this sequence, so something quite trivial, if you want to get rich to succeed, whatever you want, you must first survive. It's not like survival come as another option. 
You see, it's not like an, and you can't separate it. Like have the risk management group on the ninth floor and the traders on the twelfth floor. You can't, it's the same function. <laughs> you must survive. And as a matter of fact, risk is just survival. I remember when I started trading, I had hair, you know. <laughs> it's heavy, it's a long time ago. An old trader called me out of his board, and you get all kind of abuse by old traders who want to teach you life because they're bored, okay? And you have to listen because you, you know, you're know you junior. But the fellow said something quite interesting that stayed with me. He said, take all the risks you, you, you can. Conditional on, he said, but make sure you're in tomorrow. So you have to separate Rowan from regular risk taking. They're completely different animals. And let's see how they're completely different animals. Let's say, and, and why, and, and another reason your return will never be those of the market. I uh, seriously apologize for the crudity of, of this. Um, it's in my book uh, because I drew it myself. And as you can see, I'm not gifted. I told you I can't do tennis, I can't draw. But I insisted on the publisher keeping it in a book rather than bring me some, some you know, illustrator. So let's do this thought experiment. We have enough people here. There is a new casino in Toronto. And we have no idea what the alpha from the casino is. No idea. But we know it's steady, it's you know, run by uh, rigorous people, but we have no idea what the alpha is. Negative, positive, we have no idea. And sometimes, you know, casinos give you positive alpha or with uh, blackjack and stuff. All right. So the whole room, say about 100 people or 100 people here, because other people have something else to do. You, we go to the casino, each with an allowance, gamble for eight hours, and come back and you tally everything. You sum up all the returns, divide by everything we started with, and you got the total, okay? Now, if you add zero in an addition, does it have a big impact? No, it dilutes by one over n the number of people, nothing. So, and if number 28 gambler goes bust, or as we say in tapioca, all right? Does number 29 care? No, he may even laugh at him, okay? So, uh, simply people, this is called horizontal probability. Everything in finance is done that way. You compute cost-benefit analysis by summing up probabilities by options. But there's a flaw, and let's see how the flaw is. If any one of us here instead went to the casino for 100 days, not 100 people for one day, one person for 100 days, and started gambling, and on day 28, she or he went bust, tapioca. Would they be day 29? No, so regardless of the alpha of the casino, once you hit ruin, you're, you're gone. Now, this is not trivial, okay? Why is this not trivial? It changes the way you got to do everything. This incidentally is a uh, cartoon about that topic by, by the, I hate the cartoonist, okay? I, li I like the idea of he's a cartoonist. So who discovered that? This fellow on the right is Murray Gelman, and the fellow on the left is uh, uh, Peters, uh, both physicists, but Gelman, you may know him, Nobel Prize in Physics. He's known to have a huge ego. I mean, I'm sure this room would be too small for a very good man, let's say. <laughs> Big ego. Mer, you know, and he bullied Fried, uh, he, uh, Feynman. That kind of, he, he, he uh, started the Santa Fe Institute. If you have an American genius, that'd be him. Okay, Mary Gelman. Peter showed Gelman the way we compute probabilities in decision science and finance. And Gelman said, this is BS because of that concept. He called it ergodicity, in the sense that you cannot take a static analysis and apply it dynamically, because dynamically, your return, your average return, is multiplicated. So if you multiply by zero, 
from what I'm told, I'm sure it holds in Canada, although again, I mean, I haven't seen the evidence here. If you multiply something by zero, the total is zero, no? <laughs> that typically holds in a lot of places, even France. <laughs> if I add and add a zero, it doesn't change, okay? So, dilutes the return. So when you're, in other words, if you're absorbed, if you have an uncle point, you're gone. So focus, you know, getting the average return is absolutely of no help to you. And the return of every investor are gonna diverge over time. The average total will get the market. But I think something like um, only 10% should get above the market in this room. If you're all invested in the market, okay. So th this is very, very, very unsettling. The, the this is, uh, okay. If you had the, the problem is absorbing barriers matter. Some people understand it in some industries. They want zero blow up, zero probability of not surviving. Now there is. I came from New York using one of those. And if the error rate is 0.1 percent. I don't know if there'd be many pilots alive because over a four-year career as a pilot, it'd blow up. So, uh, taking the average is, is, is significant. <laughs> okay. the, the, and, and the way I phrased it is, when I was a trader, I said, crossing a river that is three feet deep on average, okay. <laughs> isn't something you should consider, all right? So the, the point is, so if you have second order effect, risk of absorbing, right? Now, this is so trivial, every single trader knows it. And no academic that I know knows it. So it's like having two parallel universe, okay? Every trader knows it. Okay, if you have a tail risk, you're gonna go bust. Every individual, now Goldman Sachs, they've been in existence for 149 years. We sort of all hate them, but admire them. <laughs> they may have had support by the US government last 10 years, nine years, maybe, but still we have 140 years. And these people do a lot of trades, and they have a lot of risks. It means that these people have survived to have z close to zero probability blowing up. They got up and down. And, and effectively, every trader I know treats probability of absorption differently from alpha and return and all that stuff. Because it's something very simple. If I have a tiny probability of ruin, I would be ruined. It's not like an option. Tiny pro over time, you lengthen the time. So the way people look at risk is wrong. The way you got to look at risk is if you're going to do this for the rest of your life, by how much? Is it going to shorten your life expectancy? Okay, that's the way to do it, you see? Or what's your expected life expectancy if you do this? If you had infinite lives and you smoked, your life expectancy would be something like on average 60, all right? It would lengthen by 24 years, uh, shorten by 24 years. So that is the problem that's not in literature. If I'm going to take some tail risk, Okay, how long can I do that before I'm caught, you know, by the market? That's the way to do it. But you see, what I'm discovering, and, and I insist in my book, that grandmother understand that. Our grandmothers know that. Risk professionals don't. The way they, they, they do their cost-benefit analysis is as if you're never going to take more risks in your life. But the problem is if I, if I play Russian roulette and succeed, what am I gonna do? Play again. So it's not like I have 20% chance of dying if I play Russian roulette. I have 100% chance of dying on the repetition. If you succeed, you play again. It's the same with smoking. When you analyze smoking, any cigarette, no cigarette is gonna kill you, okay? Uh, not that I enjoy it, but I'd say, you know, okay, so you take one cigarette, but show me someone who enjoyed one cigarette, and that was it for the rest of the remaining balance of his or her life. You see, you gotta look at it. So when you engage in risky activity, whether a bank, an institution, or anything, or selling options, you don't have staying power. 
At some point, it's going to catch up with you. So the problem, and now there are ways to play the game and avoid ruin. Who discovered that? How someone knows here a Kelly criterion? Kelly? Mm -hmm. Kelly at Torp? Oh, the gamblers. I mean, we had a gambler here, a charming person, and uh, all these people understand ruin. Just like traders understand ruin. Those who do things with, for, with their hands for a living. So they, uh, fellow, just got the Nobel, Richard Thaler, or Nobel, I mean, or pseudo Nobel, the Bank of Sweden Prize and Honor of Alfred Nobel, okay? But the court Nobel, for showing us that it's irrational to do what you should be doing at a casino. And let me explain. When people who are smart, those who survive, engage in any form of risk taking, they tend to play with the house's money, okay? You play with that. Actually, there's even a theorem. Uh, there is a book, uh, how, uh, which was a doctoral thesis of a famous statistician, "How to Gamble if You Must." And and uh, if you cannot imagine the abuse they got on Amazon by gamblers who thought it was a gambling book. <laughs> <laughs> but it tells you the following: the only way you can survive in gambling and not hit the barrier is to enter the casino. Say you have a thousand dollars, Canadian. Uh, okay. <laughs> thousand dollars you bet if you make money what do you do you bet more as you get close to your your uh, uncle point you reduce your bets and in fact if you have the alpha you can get your alpha that way and continue indefinitely if there's a slight alpha in a casino you will get it by shrinking on losses preemptively not shrinking <laughs> you know, smoothly shrinking and, and adding as you're making money. So it's called playing with house money. Now, these behavioral finance people find it irrational. Why? Not because they've never been to a casino, that I'm sure, but they didn't think about it dynamically. They think it's irrational to take more risk with money if it's partly the casino's money than your own, your initial endowment. And to go back to a few points, they also find it very, very illogical to be paranoid. I mean, is, okay, so do you like being paranoid? Not terribly. Sorry? Not terribly, no. Okay, nobody likes being paranoid. But let's think about it. If we as a human race weren't paranoid, then have these paranoia and conspiracies immediately springing. Okay, even if they're wrong 99% of the time, where would we be now? Extinct. You'd have, what, you'd have some nice trees here, and where we are in this building, you'd have uh, all these environmental problems would disappear. We wouldn't exist as a race. We exist only because we're paranoid. <laughs> because if you analyze dynamically, you see, the payoff from paranoia is huge. Like with a cigarette. If you're paranoid about cigarettes, I don't want to smoke once. It's irrational, the psychologist will tell you. You gotta be paranoid. And how could be structurally paranoid? No tail risk, take all the stuff you want. People do that in their lives. I don't know if you know this. Show me a person who buys a house without, insu without insurance. Okay, show me a person. I mean, you, 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 in some places, you're allowed to do that. I don't know how paternalistic, uh, the Trudeaus are here to force you, whether they force you, but, but you, you typically have to, okay, so show me a person who, uh, you know you're overpaying for the insurance. You're not overpaying for the insurance. You can't buy the house without the insurance because you can't afford that ruin and what comes out of it. So, the, uh, so that's the first point, I guess, and we can go from here. Uh, we can go from here and uh, so let me keep the paranoia on. We can have a conversation. <laughs> let me ask you, just uh, yes. let me come back to the book because uh, it's a, a fascinating read and uh, you know, anybody that's engaged in taking risk is familiar with the uh, surface notion of skin in the game. What are, could you talk a little bit about some of the unintended consequences of skin in the game and the way that it manifests itself? Okay, that's, by skin in the game, I mean thou shall not transfer your risk to society, okay, while having the benefits in some disguised way, you see. 
But there's one aspect of skill in the game that's linked to this. A friend of mine, a former Goldman uh, partner, retired, and unlike me, he didn't do math, so he decided to lose his money slowly in the restaurant business. <laughs> so you know, that's the way, you know, you want to lose your money slowly but surely, that's the place to be. So he invested in these restaurants, and then he noticed that that business is weird. First of all, I mean, so like, uh, if you ever attempted, there's ways to give money to charity and help a lot of people rather than open a restaurant. But he noticed one thing. There are awards in that business. So awards, you know, the best uh, atmosphere with sushi, the best atmosphere without sushi, that kind of awards, you know, all kinds of specialties. Then there's a gala. The restaurant that got the awards didn't make it to the gala. Why? Well, because who gives the awards? It's not the clients. You want to impress your clients, not your peers. It's other restaurant owners. So areas that have expertise are defined very simply by people have skin in the game in the sense that a plumber his PNL, okay, is not determined by what other plumbers think of him. Okay, he doesn't care about impressing other plumbers. He wants to impress his accountant. These survive, <laughs> and also the, the the there's no BS in this. But academics, who judges academics? Other academics. Other academics. So and therefore, you can have, as we have in financial economics and economics, macroeconomics, people completely out of sync with reality, and we'll never know because there's no, but a, a pilot of a plane, all these people, they're in sync with reality because those who are not, guess what? Where are they? Pilots who are not in sync with reality, where are they? At the bottom of, uh, you know, near, you know, somewhere north of Vancouver in the middle of the ocean? <laughs> okay, so that's what, so they are a field. So this is the idea of scaling the game is that any knowledge we got about anything that doesn't come from professionals who have survived is by definition tainted. It will have a flaw somewhere and you gotta find that flaw. That's my idea of the game. Of course you have ethics, you know, don't transfer your risks. If you own your own risks, you see, you have skin in the game, you will survive if you're right. If you're not right, you exit the pool and there will be no side effect of that. That's the idea of scaling the game. So coming back, you, you talk in the book about this concept of uh, the rule of the minority uh, and um, the fact that the minorities impose a cost on the majorities. So maybe if you could just outline the concept and perhaps comment on where in the financial world the minority imposes a massive cost on the majority. Okay. Uh, okay, so, so my book is about two effects. One when you put dynamics, the other one when you put scale. So scale, in other words, if I know how each one of you behaves and I add up everyone, guess what? It doesn't help me predict how the ensemble will... will, will uh, and, and how did I discover that? Uh, I was uh, uh, trying to define complex systems at a party at the Complex System Institute. And a few people from Jerusalem came. And they were religious. And I felt embarrassed because I was co-organizer and we didn't have kosher drinks. I didn't think about it. I thought, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't know you were coming and so on. Yeah, relax, relax, what? All the drinks here are kosher. What? Yeah, look at this at the bottom. Huh? Okay. So like Monsieur Jourdan, I've been speaking pros all these years, I've been drinking kosher drinks <laughs> without knowing why. 0.3% of the US population is kosher. But let's say you're Coca-Cola or a manufacturer. What do you want to do? Have a kosher truck, kosher this, kosher that, and then have an aisle, an aisle and have shipments. Of, what do you do? You make them more kosher. <laughs> if the cost is small, so someone coming from Mars and studying the food habits of the U.S. population, it would be mistaken from the food habits to believe that, or from the drinking habit, that the majority is kosher. In fact, 0.3%. <laughs> okay, so 
that is, almost all drinks are kosher. Okay, so I started looking into the, 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 the uh, right there. <laughs> At the complex, uh, you know, and it's a complexity subject in the sense that how a collective behaves differently from the individual part of that collective. So started studying how you can have a situation like that. Um, I was on American Airlines, no peanuts. Why? All you need is one person on the plane to be allergic to peanuts for no peanuts. <laughs> So, so you realize that minorities are effectively driving our habits. In, 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 and then I looked at marketing. People don't quite understand the habits of consumers. Uh, automatic cars. You think that people would have a preference for automatic cars. That's what we sell. No. Stick shift is what people preferred at a time when they still you know, had them. But if you're family of four and one person doesn't drive stick shift, guess what? The whole family will have an automatic. So, so you have these things. Now, go into markets, start examining situation in markets where the collective is different from individuals. One of them, for the minority rule, I realized, that, and, and, and it's a very simple experiment. Uh, the day when Societe Generale uh, had caught, had a, nine years ago, they had a rogue trader, okay? They sold $50 billion of stocks very quickly. It was an unconditional sale. A minority rule means someone who unconditionally will only drink kosher, someone who will not, whereas the rest of us don't mind doing both. Kosher or non-kosher, there's no difference for me, you see? Or at least small difference, but bigger for him or her who's in the minority. So I know that someone wants to sell $50 billion. Okay, what happens? We have the market is, uh, what is it now, 30 trillion? Uh, what is it? It's more, it's more than that. Sorry? More than that. 50 trillion? 70. 70. No, uh, inclu just the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the stock markets. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, 70, 70 trillion dollars. 70, okay. So drove markets lower at a time, that was a time of 30 trillion. In 2009, drove markets lower by 12%. On that minority, you see. So you realize there's always someone willing to pay up or someone willing to sell down an auction and it will determine prices, not the collective. So from that, we are, we ha it can be, the minority rule can be very, very dangerous because if you, if you tell the those who play the minority rule in politics, all you have to do is be intolerant and 98% of the population will submit to you. You see, but also it works for ethics. If you are a thief, you don't mind eating non-stolen merchandise, no? I mean, I've never been a thief, or I, just, I won't say it. <laughs> but a, a, a honest person will refuse. So all you need is a minority of honest people for society to be honest. So start looking at minority rule and notice that whenever something is stable across societies, it cannot, come, cannot be a majority rule. By definition, majorities fluctuate. It got to be a very potent minority role, <laughs> whether in politics, whether in human rights, whether in, you think with Saudi Arabia now is what happened in Saudi Arabia. Do you think it's because the majority of people don't want to do this? No, all you need is a minority of people who are intolerant and willing to shame others and say, I will not do business with you. I will not hire you as an actor. I will not play tennis with you if you, uh, uh, you know, help Saudi Arabia. And suddenly you have a spiral from there. So you know, one of the other concepts you talked in the book, book, which I thought was intriguing, was the notion that the affluent are typically easier to exploit than the, exploit than the non-affluent. How does that reconcile with the fact that, I mean, look, everybody in the room is, uh, is sort of at or near the 0.1%, um, and, and these are typically savvy individuals that have built businesses. How does the fact that they're affluent are, more, are easier to exploit yeah. reconcile with that? I mean, that was Seneca who said, that basically that if you're uh, that you're much much more likely to be a turkey of someone because more people will be you try to take your money if you're rich than if you're poor okay and 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 the examples I give are mostly from my private life is uh, a few times I mean I like a good meal a good traditional Italian meal a reasonable price 
and sometimes you drag them to these torture uh, sessions and uh, some uh, three-star Michelin where you have to eat microscopic food <laughs> and, and you have to concentrate. So I told myself, listen, would I pay $300 for the pizza, a good fresh pizza with fresh basil and fresh herbs? If I had to choose between this meal for $7.95 or the pizza for $300, I think I would pick I would pay 300 for a pizza rather than uh, these uh, complicated meals. So I realized often when you're rich, you become target of people who want to change your lifestyle so they can make more money off of you. And, and some people are vulnerable enough to fall and to, to do things because they think that's what they should be doing because they're rich. In fact, that's not optimal for them. Just like large houses. People are sad at large houses because large houses are empty, devoid of human warmth. So, uh, small little thing like that <laughs> in, uh, in a book. But that was a side chapter that was, uh, that, uh, what, what, that was a goal is only, I mean, you, if, you're gonna, if you're engaged when you want to rip people off, the best way to do it is go to the rich. Mm -hmm. so, so, the rich is much more uh, uh, exposed to being ripped off than, than the poor. So let me close off our conversation with one last question. Um, you know, you have, uh, again, this is an investor conference. Everybody in the room, to some extent, is involved in investing. Um, how, what recommendations would you have, or what it would be your top recommendation for uh, investors that want to utilize the lessons of skin in the game and anti-fragility and some of the other notions that you've spoken about in some of your past Sim books? Simple rule. First, Decide, instead of investing in medium risk security, if you invest in medium risk security, can your portfolio go to zero? It can. But if you invest half of it in half very high risk securities, and the other half in close to no risk securities, can your portfolio drop by more than half? No. So the whole idea is try to switch your risk preferences around with the same risk preference, switch your allocation around to have a part that you'll never lose and a part that you lose. So in other words, if, if, if buying protection on a portfolio, okay, allows you to be much more risky, to take much larger risks over the portion because you don't have ruin. So, which is what I call the barbell. So that's one, it's everything flows from the same idea that you want to avoid ruin, and if you avoid ruin, and guess what, and other people did not avoid ruin, that, that's where the money is made. Because if you can buy in 2008, 2009, and other people are you know, at the, at the, trying to watch TV or something to, <laughs> because to distract themselves from the pain of opening their, uh, their statement, which at the time was still in paper, that, then you have a huge edge. So that, that optionality comes from having extra cash for the crash or something like that. For example, uh, people think that cash is no asset. In fact, it's a very valuable asset if you know how to work with it. So take a lot of risks, very diversified, in other words, high risk items coupled with no risk items. The payoff is much more rational <laughs> because it will never, you never hit ruined, for example. The other one is, make sure you play with the house's money, <laughs> okay? Uh, the other one is make sure to never encounter an uncle point. An uncle point being in the army when, when you have to say, I'm out, okay? If you never want to have to liquidate, you want to do the reverse. You want to have enough of reserve to not have to liquidate and to watch other people liquidate. For small little things like that. Yeah, well, the same. Thank you. Thank okay, you for thank coming all this way to share your wisdom with us. We really appreciate it.